Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dan, the uh, webmaster of Roadway Wiz on YouTube. And tonight we have a very special webinar presentation for you folks. Um, naturally, with current events and whatnot, I felt like it would be a good idea to put together a presentation about uh, the key bridge and um, so that's what we're gonna do tonight um, joining me this evening uh, as my co-host is Laura Bianca Pruitt she is a co-webmaster of mdroads.com she is a town planner in uh, northeastern Maryland and she is an adjunct professor in the landscape architecture department at Morgan State University in Baltimore uh, Laura you've been on many programs in the past um, with me, and I wish we were doing another one under different circumstances, but uh, I don't know, what can you say? But uh, I'm glad to have you back. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. Uh, I agree. I wish the circumstances were better. Yeah, so um, we will get into a lot of a lot of different topics here related to the bridge and the disaster itself and the aftermath. But uh, for those of you who may be interested in other topics that are Maryland related, we have done a number of different programs over the last two to three years. And Laura, I think you were a member of the panel on all of these that are on the screen. Uh, these go back, as I said, to 2021, I think, in a couple of cases. Um, yeah, and a couple, uh, a couple of them we have done. Well, maybe all of them we've done um, live on location in Maryland. Uh, that that is possible. Yeah, but either either way, you have a perfect attendance record on episodes that are Maryland related. So <laughs> I want to commend you for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for people who may not have seen these already, you can find these episodes in our live content section on the homepage of the channel. And I encourage you to check those out uh, on your own time afterwards, after watching this. Um, to give you an overview of what to expect tonight, um, we're going to be talking about the Key Bridge and obviously what happened on March 26th. But we'll start with a discussion on the bridge itself and its history uh, and how it was integrated into the greater Baltimore highway system. We'll talk about the history of the Dolly, the ship that was involved in the collision. In addition to discussing the timeline of the disaster and emergency response, we'll also be examining the near-term and long-term impacts to the Port of Baltimore and the neighboring highways and alternate routes. And then we'll also spend some time at the end of the presentation discussing potential future timelines and what uh, a future bridge at the site might uh, require in terms of the amount of time to build and even some of the means and methods that you might see involved in a project like that. So all of that is ahead. Um, I think that any discussion about the the events of the last 10 days or two weeks has to begin with a discussion on the history of the key bridge itself. Um, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, or the Baltimore Outer Harbor Crossing, as it was known, as, as was its working title, was planned as far back as the 1950s, um, when the expressway system of the Baltimore area was developed around that time. The plan for a circumferential route encircling Baltimore City was put forth. Uh, the original idea for a crossing of the Outer Harbor involved a tunnel between Hawkins Point and Sullers Point, opposite Fort Carroll and Fort Armistead. The original plan was for a four-lane tunnel, and this was the case in the 1960s. However, due to funding constraints, the tunnel proposal was scaled, scaled back to a single-bore two-lane tunnel uh, in the late 60s. In July 1970, the state of Maryland entertained bids for the two-lane tunnel project, but none of these bids were accepted or pursued due to higher than expected costs. The state of Maryland therefore withdrew their support for the tunnel option and instead endorsed the, interestingly, more economical four-lane bridge option. And bids for this idea were put forth in 1972 and accepted in August of that year. What's interesting to note is that the original 
planned two-lane approaches, which were going to be built in conjunction with this two-lane tunnel, were retained as originally planned. And so that is why the approaches on both sides of the bridge were originally only two lanes. Right. And I think it's worth noting, too, that, um, uh, that um, you know, the Fort McHenry Tunnel was then built later. So, you know, at the time, it was seen as, you know, the, the tunnel being way too costly. But there were still plans to build a bridge to, um, further north um, at, um, at Fort McHenry. And then that later was changed into a tunnel. And then that project was completed in 1985. So just to kind of give the context for why, we, why there are ultimately two tunnels in Baltimore. Yeah, so the, the timeline here, like 1970-ish, there was only one harbor crossing at this point, and that was the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel, which was opened in 1958, I believe. Um, nowadays, it's Interstate 895. But there was, as you say, there were dotted lines on the map for other harbor crossings, including what became I-95 in the 1980s. So this right. project was pursued as really a relief route for... The, the Harbor Tunnel, and also because I-95 was still a dotted line through Baltimore City at this point, it was not a done deal that that project would ever see the light of day. So that's kind of the context for how this project came to be. Yeah. So but yeah. Can... Oh, go on. I was just going to say, um, well, why don't you go ahead? You had something else you wanted to say, right? Well, I was going to talk a little bit about Francis Scott Key. Um, and... Yeah, let's um, let's get to that. Um, yeah. We'll so I think. That. Yeah. Um, so it's worth it's worth noting that so construction of the bridge was between 1972 and 1977. During construction of the bridge was 19 you know in 1976 was the American bicentennial celebrations and so it was at that time that it was decided to um, name it the bridge um, in honor of Francis Scott Key who um, was the author of The Defense of Fort McHenry, which is the poem that ultimately became the Star Spangled Banner and the national anthem of the country. Um, he himself was a lawyer, author, and a poet um, from Frederick, Maryland. He, was, he observed the British bombardment of Fort McHenry in September 1814, um, which was during the, uh, the misnomer name of the War of 1812, which went longer than one year but anyway um he was aboard an american truce ship um with the british royal navy fleet in the baltimore harbor near Sollers point um approximately about 100 yards from where the bridge was um and, and while he was there he was inspired seeing the american flag still flying over um fort mchenry at dawn and that's um uh, how he was inspired to write the poem um the um the song that came about from the poem eventually you know slowly gained popularity and um it be um became got its official status and became the national anthem with an act of congress in 1931 signed by um president herbert Hoover. <clears throat> yeah and i think isn't it true that there's also a buoy out in the harbor not far from where the bridge is Yes. That and symbolizes so that, the approximate, the so-called location where he witnessed all of this. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, and it's marked in the colors of the U.S. flag. Makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, um, what's, in, what's interesting is that, you know, as you previously mentioned, it, the, um, the oh. highway was built as if um, the approaches were built as if it was still going to be the four lane bridge option. So... When it opened in 1977, everything was signed as Maryland 695, as it wasn't built in compliance with interstate standards. It wasn't until later that improvements were made to the bridge approaches. Um, in the early 1980s was when the southern approach um, was dualized, which also included the construction of um, a parallel drawbridge over Curtis Creek at the Beltway's zero mile location. And that was completed in 1981. The northern approach um, remained as a two-lane viaduct until um, the mid-1990s. 
and it was a and it was built as a viaduct viaduct at first at first because of all of the train lines um, and roads that um, went into and out of Bethlehem Steel. Um, and my Baltimore accent showing viaduct Bethlehem Steel. Uh, but anyway, um, in the mid 1990s, the um, the viaduct was removed. Um, well, ultimately, another two lanes were built, and then um, next to the viaduct, the viaduct um, then was removed and became the westbound um, approach. But it was all built at grade, um, and that project was ultimately completed in 2000. And so at that point, everything is, uh, you know, official by that point. I mean, there were, my understanding is it happened even earlier than 2000 that these er that these areas were assigned as 695. Um, but what's interesting is that um, Maryland um, State Highway Administration, SHA, still considers the Beltway to be Maryland 695 from the Northeast 95 Junction um, near Essex all the way to the um, interchange with 97, um, I-97 in Farmdale. And there is a Maryland 695 sign in the wild. Um, it is on Pulaski Highway. And it's part of a little green sign where it says MD 695 Junction. <clears throat> so that's kind of a fun fact. I'm assuming that sign would be uh, older than the 1990s. I would assume so. What's interesting is I included it as part of the itinerary for my 2015 Baltimore meet. And at the time, it was knocked down and later and, and like during the time of the meet. So I thought at that point, oh, no, it's a goner. But they re-put it up, the same sign. Oh, all right. Yeah. So let me give you some overview notes here of the bridge itself. So construction began in August of 1972, and the bridge opened to traffic on March 23rd, 1977. The continuous truss superstructure that you see, it's got a very interesting uh, and unique arch-like shape to it. Um, that structure is about a half a mile long in total. Uh, the central navigation span is 1,200 feet. Uh, the roadway reaches a crown at a height of 185 feet above mean sea level. It carries four lanes of Interstate 695, Baltimore Beltway. Um, Interesting to note that there are no shoulders on this bridge. Uh, the total length of the bridge from end to end is about a mile and a half. Construction of the bridge in the 1970s cost $60 million to build. And I have a few pictures of my own that I've taken from the last few years via drone and from ground level that I'm going to scroll through here in the next couple of minutes. But uh, Laura, perhaps you could, while I'm doing this, chime in on... Um, what there's been a lot of talk about this in the last 10 days that I've really picked up on and maybe you can you know educate our audience about what the key bridge means to Baltimoreans and what it means to Marylanders both before both when it was with us and since it has left us yeah so um well, first, I, I want to point out, thanks, Steve Anderson in the chat, that for pointing out that the Harbor Tunnel um, opened in 1957. Um, and I think what's really relevant about what the key bridge means to people is, you know, the, it's the only bridge crossing in uh, of the of the major interstates in the Baltimore area, because the other two crossings are tunnels of, 90, of I-95 and 895. 695 is the only one that's a bridge. So it's significant in that sense that it's like the like landmark bridge. So it's it's a landmark in a lot of ways. Um, it symbolizes the connecting of the peninsulas where um, previously Bethlehem Steel um, was in Sparrows Point and is now Trade Point Atlantic um, to um, Hawkins Point. And it and really is sort of the entry point into like the unofficial like entry point into the inner harbor and for the Port of Baltimore. And, you know, so it's it's got these ties to industry, um, working class Baltimore. The you know, this, the bridge is like a symbol um, of, you know, like this huge like this uh, symbol of steel and our steel history. 
with Buffalo Steel. And um, also just all of the history of, you know, industry in general in Baltimore and the ports. Um, also, symbolically, it is seen as, you know, when people cross it, that it's like home to them. Like, oh, you know, I've crossed it. So not just people that live in, you know, southeastern Baltimore County and in Anne Arundel County, but also, but also, you know, people further out. Uh, I live in Chrysler County. And so people think of the bridge as sort of like the way to bypass Baltimore to get to and from the airport, for instance. So when you cross over the bridge, you know, when you're coming from somewhere else, you're coming from the airport, you're coming from some other trip. That's home. Like, oh, you're home. We made it. You're in Baltimore. I think it's also notable, too, uh, Baltimore has a crew, has cruise ships as well. And so it's, you know, it's seen as, you know, the, the, the cruise ships, you know, going under the bridge, you know, as, you know, when you're first, le- like, leaving, like, oh, we're starting our cruise, but also symbolizing, like, oh, we're coming home. And so, yeah. you know, not just cruise ships, but, you know, just... Uh, yeah, but all ships that cross under that it has that that symbol. So a lot of people remember the bridge being built, particularly of like my parents' generation. My parents, you know, uh, my parents were born in 1954, 1955, so they would have been in their twenties. You know, so very pivotal, like you know, seeing this project get built at the same time as sort of, you know, you're com- coming of age. So there's that factor for a lot of, you know, older people in the region that they grew up with the bridge. Like they grew up watching it get built as they became adults. And, you know, the symbolization of, you know, the work life that comes with that. So it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And when the bridge went down, of course, it was absolutely devastating to me. Um, that's actually, I think the uh, you know, heartbreaking, devastating. Those were the words I used when I was, you know, in a, a frantic upset when Mike woke me up at 4.30 in the morning um, to let me know that it happened because he had seen the news. Um, but it meant so, but, you know, it it didn't just mean a lot to me as someone who's a bridge enthusiast and a road geek and, you know, overall transportation planning nerd, but for the entire area, it was like, there was a real grief like losing, you know, someone dear um, with the bridge collapse. And it was very, you know, so, it, you know, the it just seems like everyone in the whole metro area was just very upset and uh, the bridge coming down. And then, of course, of the lives lost. Yeah, it, 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 it's an interesting point that you make about, you know, the bridge being the signature bridge of Baltimore, you know, because it is the only major bridge i mean there are other ones right but this is the one when you think of baltimore this is the one you think of um so it is one of the city's most prominent landmarks yeah um even though by i i I would imagine by most standards it is somewhat modest compared to other monumental structures but it is baltimore's bridge and so it's it's the landmark that everybody in the area knows about and has as I said, they've lived with it for decades, right? Yeah, I want to throw I want to throw out there because um, my husband Mike, you know, Mister MD Rhodes is in the chat, and he brings up a very good point about you know why the tunnel option was also in play um, had to do with air traffic because um, the current Dundalk Marine Terminal um, was still the municipal airport because um, B- until BWI opened in the early 1960s. I didn't know that there was an airport over that way. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would make sense. Yeah. You wouldn't want to put a bridge near flight paths, right? Right. Okay. So we've been scrolling through pictures of the bridge. This one that we're on right now on this slide, this was taken from Fort Armistead Park in Baltimore City. This is easily the best vantage point um, of the bridge from any public viewing area and oh by the way it was a great place to launch my drone from um so that's the story with that picture if i scroll back one slide i want to make you aware of this image before we move on um this angle is zoomed in 
Uh, it was taken from the Sparrows Point side of the harbor along Bethlehem Boulevard. And I want you to keep this view in mind for a few minutes from now when we look at the uh, post-collapse footage. All right. So that is the story of the bridge. We also have to discuss the ship that was involved in the collision. Um, the MV Dolly, which is considered by most standards today to be a large cargo ship, even though ships have only gotten bigger and bigger in the decades since the Key Bridge was built. Um, it's considered by today's standards to be a large ship. Um, it was built by Hyundai Heavy Industries in South Korea. She was built as yard number 2678 and completed in 2015. Uh, she was, her namesake is the famous Spanish artist Salvador Dali. Um, the Dali is 984 feet long with a beam of 158 feet. She weighs in at 95,000 gross register tons and has a displacement tonnage of about 148,000. She can carry 115,000 deadweight tons. That is a measurement of the num that is that is the measure of the weight of cargo that the ship can carry fully loaded. Her propulsion system can generate 55,000 horsepower to achieve a service speed of 22 knots. Her container capacity when fully equipped is 10,000 TEUs. Now, for those of you who don't know what a TEU is, that is that stands for 20 foot equivalent unit it is a unit of measurement for cargo capacity used predominantly for container ships and ports uh, it's based on the volume of a 20 foot long intermodal container which is a standard sized metal box which can easily be transferred between different modes of transportation such as between ships trains and trucks and this the transfer of course happens within these port facilities the Dolly was built to what is considered to be New Panamax capacity. Uh, the New Panama Canal locks, which were completed in 2016, enabled ever larger vessels to traverse the canal, and these locks were built up to, a, to accommodate the size of certain vessels, and the Dolly was built to be able to traverse these locks. The ship, in addition to its standard propulsion system, is equipped with bow thrusters, which enable the ship to drift laterally, in addition to its standard propulsion system, uh, reducing the need for tugboat support while maneuvering in port. While there have been reported incidents in the media involving this ship since 2016, none of these incidents suggest a pattern of recurring problems with the ship itself. So there was, there was a report that came out shortly after the collapse that there had been an incident at a port at Antwerp in Belgium involving the ship colliding with the pier that it was docking at. Um, there's no evidence, and there were, I think a, there might have been a couple of other things that came up along the way, but there's no evidence when you pile up all of those incidents to point to a single you know, weak point in the ship itself. It is also not known at this time if any of Dolly's sister ships in her class have reported similar problems regarding power loss and propulsion since they came into service several years ago. Um, this is going to be something that's worth keeping an eye on because in the history of ocean travel, um, sometimes issues happen across a ship sometimes a ship just has the same issue that recurs over time other times these issues happen within a class of ship which is to say that sometimes an issue will pop up with one ship and then you'll see it pop up with the other ships in the class like if for instance the dolly has three sister ships i don't know what the exact number is but let's say it's three um those other three ships might exhibit the same issues down the line in their lifespan. Um, because these things, like a, a class of ship is designed to be replicated. You, when you construct a ship, you're basically starting off with a prototype that then gets replicated. 
Um, and so I suspect that if there is an underlying issue that they find in the investigation into this, that they're going to have to go back and look into the sister ships in the class to also make the same changes, if that is what ends up being the case. Uh, the Dolly was uh, on loan to Maersk, which is a global container shipping company, and the ship's official registry is in Singapore. The backstory is what it is at this point. Um, the collapse occurred at 1.28 a.m. on March 26th, 2024. The Dolly had just departed the port of Baltimore and was outbound in the channel towards Chesapeake Bay at the time of the incident. The Dolly was making forward speed of about 9 miles an hour. As is standard protocol in the port of Baltimore, the Dolly was under command of a harbor pilot at the time of the incident. For those of you who may not know, harbor pilots legally assume full command of a ship within their territorial waters and have rank above all of the ship's officers, including the captain. They are helpful in navigating ships that they assume command of through areas they may not be familiar with, being the crew, of course, and are well-versed in the potential local hazards of any navigation channel. So it's important to note that the crew was not officially under command of their ship at the time, but this is standard operating procedure. Another thing that we should mention as regards to protocol are tugboats, because this has been another topic that's been brought up in the news, that there were no tugboats in the area of the ship when the incident took place. Actually, what's true is that tugboats had been in the area assisting the ship as it departed from its pier only a few minutes before. But as per protocol, once Dolly began her outbound trip in the channel, tugboats broke away from the ship um, because they had finished up their required duties of assisting the ship out of port at the time. Those of you, I'm sure you've seen the video of the collapse a thousand times by now, and we won't replay it on this presentation. But as you can see in the video, um, conditions were clear. There was no issues with visibility at the time. Um, there were stiff winds, but that was not unusual. It's not something that a ship the size of the Dolly can't handle on her own. The Dolly reported two separate power failures at around 1.25 a.m. These failures resulted in a loss of propulsion and steering. It's believed that the ship began to drift westward away from the main channel and in the direction of the South Mainspan Foundation. A Mayday call was issued during this set of power failures. It was received by all local authorities. The MDTA police, uh, the MDTA being the Maryland Transportation Authority, they are the owners and operators of the Key Bridge and also the tunnels in downtown Baltimore. Their police department heard the distress call over the radio and their patrol cars, which were normally stationed one on each end of the bridge doing regular patrols, were directed to hold traffic on both approaches to the bridge. It is likely that this simple action saved many lives. I don't know that we have talked about that enough, the actions of the NDTA police that night. Um, because when you watch the, the video, like before the collision, even at 1, 1 30 in the morning, there's still a good amount of traffic going over that bridge. Um, and there were, there was obviously, we'll talk about the construction that was going on at the time, but a lot of that traffic I would imagine was commercial traffic. Um, because, you know, these, these facilities operate, these port facilities operate around the clock, more or less. Um, so MDTA police stopped traffic. Also, in the same time, tugboats that had broken away from the Dolly per protocol were called back towards the ship to provide assistance and try to corral the ship as it left the main channel. However, they did not arrive in time. The collision took place at 1.28 in the morning. You can see on this diagram that we have at the bottom of this slide where the location of the impact was. It was a direct hit on the South Mainspan Foundation, 
which resulted in a complete and catastrophic collapse of the entire main span superstructure. A few of the spans on the Dundalk side of the bridge were also taken out um, as part of this. Well, before I go to this slide. The collapse completely blocked the main shipping channel into and out of the port of Baltimore and the Patapsco River, resulting in the full shutdown of the port immediately and indefinitely. The Baltimore Beltway I-695 is also closed indefinitely between exit 1 in Hawkins Point and exit 43, which is Bethlehem Boulevard in Sparrows Point. <clears throat> the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, began an, an investigation into the disaster within hours of the collapse. The investigation is expected to take months to complete and will ultimately reconstruct the events in the minutes leading up to the collision and will likely also assign blame and all sorts of other things. There is no, it's important that we understand at this juncture that there is no indication that the bridge itself or its design and structure played any role in the disaster. I cannot emphasize enough the size of this ship, traveling at the speed it was traveling at, you know, I, I'm an engineer, so I, I know a thing or two about physics. And when you take a structure like the Key Bridge, or really any structure for that matter, and you place a ship as large as this, moving at that rate of speed, it's going to topple over basically anything it comes in contact with. Um... It doesn't really matter what that bridge was, what those piers were designed with. You know, it, it would not have made a difference. Um, and even if the bridge had remained standing, even if it had sustained damage, it still is likely that the bridge would have been a total loss anyway. Because there's only a certain amount of repairs that you can actually make to a structure. Like, once a structure sustains a certain amount of damage, it becomes unstable. It might remain standing, but it will be unstable. And so, therefore, it's not safe to put people on to try to fix. That's the other part of this. Um, so, it, it really... To me, this looks like a one-in-a-billion kind of thing. That just... It's a freak thing that happened. Um, and it's... Obviously, we see the catastrophic results of it. But I think that the NTSB's investigation is going to tell us a lot about what actually went wrong on the ship. Because that's what I'm most interested in. Because if, you know, as I look at it as an engineer, it's going to be much more economical and much more realistic in the future for us to address the problems on the vessels themselves if this is a problem that has a chance to recur elsewhere in the fleet, then it is to go around and spend hundreds of billions of our tax dollars building these artificial dolphins in the middle of the harbor to try to protect our bridges from collisions at sea, or collisions with the piers and whatnot. Um, so that is yeah. the situation with the investigation. Um, yeah, it's pretty incredible when you look at how large the dolly is. Um, I've seen a lot of diagrams floating around where um, they've compared it to like various skyscrapers. <laughs> and it's just incredible to see how huge it is. And that was the most striking thing to me when I saw it for the first time um, in person. Just that it's like the equivalent of like a skyscraper well, you yeah, it's, a, it's a thousand feet long yeah right so you place a thousand foot skyscraper with a propulsion system on it and i don't care what you design that thing is gonna plow through anything it's it's just that's that's the reality um so i'm much more interested in addressing the issues that are shipboard not necessarily the issues that people might point out in the harbor itself. Because um, we have to address what happened with this ship. Because if it can happen once, it can happen again, right? Right. So, 
to me, that's where my focus is. I'm not so interested in bridge protection. Because if we correct the issue that happened with the ship, then the rest of it corrects itself. Right. And I guarantee you it's going to be far more economical. Right. And which is ultimately what we're looking for, right? Yeah. Um, so the other thing that I want to say regarding the status of the wreckage is that removal of the debris began really in the hours after the collapse. However, as you can see on this picture that's provided by the NTSB, um, this is a lot of steel. This is millions of pounds of steel, millions of tons even, I would imagine, if you add it all up. Um, there are thousands of tons of wreckage just on top of the ship itself that has to be cleared. Um, the priorities at this point are going to be removing the debris from the ship first so that they can free the ship from where it's stuck and bring it back to port. It's worth noting that we're more than 10 days out from the collapse, and by the way, the crew of this ship has been trapped on the ship the entire time. Um, which is perhaps worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, so, freeing the ship is the first priority, and then, once they've done that, clearing the main channel becomes the next priority. Um, there was news earlier today, I believe, that... The Coast Guard has set a rough timeline of end of the month of April to try to get a part of the channel open. Um, and they have set a very aggressive timeline of reopening the full channel to regular use by the end of May. So time will tell if that deadline can be met. Yes, and President Biden reiterated that um, those deadlines um, on his visit today. To, um, That's right, yeah. The president was in Baltimore today, right? Yes, and I have sort of proof. I mean, I didn't see him personally, <laughs> um, but I happened to be driving. I, I got caught in some traffic, and um, I was driving um, earlier today from a um, physical therapy appointment um, in Catonsville. So I was on um, 95 and um, saw a significant number of police vehicles. And then when I got to the, um, the more northern 95-695 interchange, it was like a never-ending row <laughs> going to, um, towards, um, towards Dundalk mm -hmm. on 695 East. So I suspect that was actually that they were perhaps escorting the president. Well, maybe. Maybe. I mean, who knows? But it was definitely, when I saw it at first, I was like, that's a lot. I've never seen so many. And then it occurred to me, like, oh, that's right. He's coming today. Oh, yeah. Yeah? <clears throat> All right. So six people were killed in the collapse. They were all from a construction crew that was produced that was um, performing overnight repair work. They were doing concrete repairs to the bridge deck. Um, there were a total of eight people on the bridge. Um, two of these people were rescued. There was one worker and one inspector who were rescued from the water after the collapse, and they are expected to fully recover. The six people who were killed have been identified, and I have placed their names to the best of the knowledge that's available at this time uh, on your screen here. Uh, yeah. These names were reported first by the Baltimore Sun earlier in the week, and I believe them to still be accurate as of the recording of this episode. Yeah, in fact, if, if I'd like to talk about each person who, um, who passed away. Um, forgive me if I mess up pronunciations. Um, but yes, I highly recommend looking for, um, the Baltimore, there's a very good Baltimore Sun article right up. Um, I, it's worth noting that this, these men, um, who died, um, were all immigrants, um, from Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Um, so the Baltimore's Latino community is very much grieving their loss. Um, just wanted to give a little bit about each person. So Miguel Luna, he was um, 
49. He um, is from El Salvador um, and came to the U.S. about 19 years ago. Um, he um, became a welder and lived in Glen Burnie. Um, his wife operates a food truck um, out of Glen Burnie. Um, he is known as being a hardworking family man um, who had three children and is also a grandfather. Um, Alejandro um, Alex Hernandez Fuentes um, was the foreman of the crew um, working on the bridge that night. He was described as um, being a fireball that um, took his job seriously, climbed the, and he climbed the ranks at um, Broner Builders. Um, going from a laborer to driving a company truck. Um, he was known as being a devout Christian who encouraged his coworkers to turn on religious radio stations as they drew from, um, drove from job to job. He was born in Mexico, li um, lived in Essex. Um, his body was one of the two that were found, um, submerged in the Patapsco. His brother-in-law, um, Julio, was um, one of the two people who um, survived. Uh, Maynard um, Isser Suazo Zandoval, um, he grew up in Honduras, has been in the United States 17 years. Um, he um, basically, he had a dream of owning his own business one day. He was very passionate about sending money home and sponsored a soccer league back in Honduras. Um Dorlian um, Ronio Castillo Cabrera um, is from Guatemala. Um, he was known as being a kind person with a joyous sense of humor. He um, liked to volunteer to drive his crew members around, as well as other members of the um, Latino community in Baltimore. <sighs> and his body was also um, recovered. Um, Jose Minor Lopez. Um, he was described as a loving family man and a tenant father who immigrated 19 years ago from Guatemala. Um, his um, wife worked at Elf Corner Cafe in Dundalk. So definitely, you know, support them. And they have a GoFundMe set up um, the co that the um, co-owner of the cafe set up. Um, Carlos Hernandez. Um, Let's see. Um, He's the one that we don't know that much about, I think. Correct. Although President Biden, um, based off of what I was reading today, it's very sad. Is um, based off of uh, based off of one of the articles. Um, he re apparently he revealed today that one of the workers, a 24 year old named Carlos, had texted a loved one shortly before his death to say his crew had just laid cement and was waiting for it to dry. Yeah, I think they were on break at the time. That's, yes. that's what I read somewhere. It might have been that same article. Yes. But yeah, this this whole thing really hit me because these are construction guys. Yes. And my day job is as civil engineer, and I've worked on road and bridge projects all across the New York metro area as a professional over the last 15 years. <clears throat> and these guys are just like the guys I work with every day. You know, they come to work, they... You know, construction is not a risk-free proposition, so I don't think it's inappropriate to say that they do put their lives on the line. And, um, you know, I, I thought about, you know, the guys and, you know, the one inspector was the bridge inspector. I mean, that could have been me, you know, that, that could have, that was my job, you know, when, especially when I was starting out in the business as, you know, an inspector following a crew around, you know, that's, that's me. That, that's what I thought about, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it really it really threw me for a loop those those first couple of days, especially just thinking about, um, just thinking about how you know these guys who are like dude they are our brothers even though we never have met before, um, you know that I was just thinking about stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean they, I mean they represent. I mean, they, they, I mean, they represent, you know, so much of, you know, hardworking, you know, immigrants to America, the Baltimore Latino community, the type of people that, you know, 
generations of immigrants have come to Baltimore. At one point, Baltimore, Baltimore. At one point in U.S. history, Baltimore was the second largest, um, you know, welcome, welcoming city of of immigrants after Ellis Island. So it oh. really, it so it hits me that it's like, you know, that their sacrifice is the sacrifice of so many, mm-hmm. you know, people, you know, in industrial Baltimore over the many, you know, generations. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the story with the victims. Now, I... In the days after the collapse, I, I came down the following weekend, about five days afterwards, and I spent the day with, I ran into you along the way, as well as a couple of our other friends, and um, so these pictures that you're going to see of the aftermath are my own uh, from March 30th. Um, I bring up this picture that you saw earlier in the presentation that was taken from Sparrow's Point, and this is the before image. And I think that when you see the after image, it really puts into perspective the completeness and the catastrophic nature of what has happened here. Um, The point has been made a few times, and I I will repeat it. It's not my original thought, but it's too good not to share, that we as engineers spend five years or so, maybe even longer in some cases, building these monumental structures that people look at and they, they look at with pride. You know, as, as we said earlier, this is a bridge that, you know, the, the region and the city were very proud of. It took us five years to build this bridge. It took five seconds to destroy it. So these pictures were taken from the Sparrows Point lookout along Bethlehem Boulevard. <clears throat> and when we were there, Laura, you were with me when we when we were here. Um, there was a sort of like a makeshift place that was carved out along the boulevard there, along the water. And that's where the media were set up and they were doing all sorts of stuff. And then general public was allowed to come in briefly for a few minutes at a time and, and view the, the collapse from there. And... Um, there was an eerie stillness and quiet to the whole area. Like, you know, you don't, you obviously don't hear traffic on the bridge. You don't see traffic coming in and out of the harbor. Um, it was very surreal. And, and this is coming from someone who doesn't live there and has never really been attached to this area historically. So I can only imagine what it was like for lifelong residents who were, as, it, as you alluded to before, were very familiar with this bridge and were very identified with it. Yeah. Um, it was very shocking for me to see it in person. Um, it was, it's, it, it's very weird um, because <clears throat> Yeah, it was it was it was it was just eerie to to see it like that. Yeah. Yeah, these these are a couple other vantage points that we saw. This is from uh Dundalk. This is along Dundalk Avenue across from one of the port facilities. Um And then this is the view from Fort McHenry. So, Fort McHenry is right in right at the end of the harbor there, right downtown. And from this vantage point, we're about three miles away from the bridge to the northwest. But here you can see, again, a nice, or not so nice, but it's a it's a profile view of the whole uh, collapse zone. Uh, and, of course, the ship is very prominent here. Uh, again, like, even three miles distant, this ship is huge. Um and I think I think it's true that since the Key Bridge was completed in 1977, the size of container ships entering the Port of Baltimore has increased by about four times. So the ships are four times bigger than they were in 1977, and the bridge is what it is. I mean, they built it based on the current and future projections of traffic in and out of the harbor. 
but that has not prevented ever larger ships from being designed and ever larger ships from being built. And so, yeah, it's it's quite it's quite possible that some of the uh, infrastructure within the port itself has become outdated with the size increase in these ships. And that's something that's going to have to be discussed and addressed in the future. There's no question. <clears throat> Let's talk about quickly the impacts of the Port of Baltimore. As I said, as of this evening, the port is completely closed to all traffic. <clears throat> Uh, there's nobody coming in. There's nobody going out. In fact, when I was there last weekend, uh, there were several ships that were tied up in port, and it was very obvious that they were not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Not with the navigation channel blocked. But the Port of Baltimore is America's ninth largest port facility by volume of goods. It serviced about $80 billion worth of cargo in 2023. Uh, America's Largest port facility for specialized cargo. Something you might not know about the port is that it is the primary port of entry for imported vehicles. About 700,000 imports pass through the port annually. I believe Mercedes-Benz is chief among them. Um, something else you might not know is that America exports a lot of coal. And 25% of all of its coal exports pass through the port of Baltimore. So this is, we think of this as a local and maybe a regional issue, this bridge collapse, but with the port taken out of service for a month or two months or however long it's going to be, this is going to have ripple effects globally. The shipment of vehicles into the port, the shipment of um, coal and other natural resources out of the port. All of that stuff has come to a standstill for now, and so you're going to see ripple effects elsewhere, globally, as this continues. Um, something else that Laura alluded to was the, sh the port's uh, robust cruise ship terminal. There are berths for Royal Caribbean, Carnival, and Norwegian cruise lines. In fact, there was a cruise ship from Carnival, I think it was, that had left the port a few days prior to the collapse. And they were at sea when the collapse took place. And I believe they were diverted to Norfolk in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Yes. And then they were taken by bus back to Baltimore. That's yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe that the cruise industry is going to temporarily relocate down there. Uh, at least for the next however long it takes to get the main channel open. The other, the human aspect of this... Um, cannot be overstated and that is that the port facilities employ about 15,000 people directly all of whom are more or less out of a job at this point there are another 140,000 additional jobs that are associated with port activities directly so these are other jobs that are in the service sector that are not necessarily on the payroll of the port of Baltimore but they also help support the port activities so you're talking about 150,000 jobs that have been impacted in some respect. And if we prorate that out to the number of households affected, number of households, the number of people, when you add, add that all together, you're talking about easily a half a million people who are impacted directly or indirectly by the closure of the port for a significant duration of time. Emergency legislation in the Maryland State House was moving through the process. Laura, is there any update on that? I know that Governor Wes Moore in Maryland was going to support emergency measures that would keep uh, paychecks coming to the port workers during the closure. Um, is there anything new to report on that? Um, that's a good question. I know that they opened some like, um, like sort of employment, um, centers. Um, I'm going to have to, um, look that up as we speak and I'll have to get back to you. Yeah. You can put the answer in the, in the live chat for everybody. Yes, we'll do. <laughs> um, so that is the port side of this. Now, for those of you who are road enthusiasts, and all that, we know you're out there. Um, 
This is going to have near-term and long-term impacts for the alternate facilities on the interstate highway system. Um, the other two harbor crossings in Baltimore are the ones that we have to talk about first. The harbor tunnel I-895 has a maximum vertical clearance of 13 foot 6. The Fort McHenry tunnel I-95 has a maximum clearance of 14 foot 6. Any vehicle that exceeds these heights are naturally forbidden from using the tunnels. Also, any hazardous materials or chemicals are automatically forbidden from using the tunnels. The Key Bridge was one of the main alternate routes that accommodated these vehicles. In addition to all the commercial traffic that was coming in and out of Sparrows Point and out of the Dundalk Marine Terminals. With the bridge no longer an option, that means that the Baltimore Beltway, the north side of it, or the northern arc of the Circumferential Highway, now becomes the only interstate standard alternate route for these vehicles for the foreseeable future. This graphic that was produced by the Maryland Transportation Authority in the last few days sort of illustrates what I just summarized on the previous slide, how you have the highways color-coded here, you have the Harbor Tunnel in purple, you have the Fort McHenry Tunnel in I-95 in the light blue. With the Key Bridge out of service in the southeastern quadrant, that means that the long way around the northern arc is the only path for certain vehicles around the metro. And I think it, it remains to be seen how this is going to shake out because these things take time to settle out and redistribute themselves. But it remains to be seen what long-term and lasting uh, congestion issues remain at the harbor crossings. Um, I would imagine that most of the alternate volume is going to be taken by the harbor tunnel it seems like that's the one that's best positioned and best poised to accommodate the alternate, the alternate volume that would have been taken by the key bridge. Um, and the, and these are very, this is very early on. We're not even two weeks after the collapse, but it seems like that's how it's playing out. Like the Harbor tunnel has seen a significant increase in volume uh, in the 10 days since the collapse. And, yeah, the, the returns are incomplete because the week of the collapse, I believe, was spring break in Baltimore. Uh, so schools were not in session. I think I have that right, don't I, Laura? Um, yes. Okay. So we weren't seeing a normal rush hour during that week anyway. This has been the first week where we've seen like normal traffic patterns, quote unquote. And from what I've seen to this point, it looks like while 95 remains at a good level of service at or an unchanged or an insignificantly different level of service at most hours, it does seem like the Harbor Tunnel is going to see uh, the brunt of uh, additional traffic delays. So that's the way it's looking at this point. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so where do we go from here? Um, as I said, the NTSB's investigation will continue in the months ahead. As that is happening, demolition and removal of the bridge from the navigation channel is ongoing. It will be a 24-7 operation, weather permitting. Again, the goal is to reopen the Port of Baltimore as soon as possible. They, the Coast Guard believes this might happen on a limited basis by the end of the month. They would like to resume normal shipping operations by Memorial Day. At well, same, oh, oh um, can I add? Yeah. Um, since we're talking about the road to recovery, what I found out news-wise um, regarding the Port Act is that it um, it passed the state Senate and um, the House of Delegates is, it, this is as of this morning, they were expected to approve the Port Act today and that if so, it would be sent to Governor Westmore's desk for his signature. Um, an article, unfortunately, I can't access due to a paywall um, that's from five hours ago, says that Governor, um, in Baltimore Business Journal, that Governor Westmore on Friday allocated $60 million to set up a variety of programs to help businesses and workers affected by the Key Bridge collapse. So I don't know if that's part of the Port Act bill or if that's something additional, but all this to say is that these things are happening quickly. <laughs> so it like, it's, you know, it, like it's almost like every day the news of what's happening as far as um, relief 
for businesses and workers affected by the T-Bridge collapse um, is ongoing and changing. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more news that comes out of this. You know, the investigation stuff that comes out is going to be big. Um, also, you're hearing news about the potential insurance uh, liability side of this. That's going to take years to play out, I'm sure. Um, so this is all stuff that's going to be very fluid in the coming weeks and months. So um, yeah, it's not going to be it's not going to be boring if you like keeping up with current events like this. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, that and is... in fact, yeah, and in fact, there was a question in the chat about you know the the liability from the ship companies and you know uh, and Congress paying for it. That yes, the, you you brought up a good point about how like the insurance factor can take years. So these sort of emergency funds are you know are you know needed in a lot of cases because if you were to wait for the insurance to, you know, play out, like it doesn't help the immediate, you know, effects that are happening like literally today. So it's better that's why to just you... pay for it up front with your own money and then get reimbursed later. Correct. Yeah. Cause otherwise you'd be waiting years right. for anything. Yep. Um, you know how quickly our legal system moves. Um, so that is the near term future. That's what we have in the next couple of months. Okay, getting the port open, getting the channel open, uh, demolition of the existing bridge continuing. Let's look, let's end this presentation looking a little bit longer into the future. So what is a potential successor to this project, the successor to the Key Bridge, which I am nicknaming Key Bridge 2? what might this bridge look like? What might some of the means and methods be? And we might have some fun thinking about potential construction timelines and whatnot. Although I am not going to go on the record of, you know, looking into my crystal ball or my looking at my magic eight ball and all that stuff. You will not get predictions from me. I think that one of the things that is so difficult about the situation is that it is, in our time anyway, it is an unprecedented situation. And so a lot of the timelines that have been put out are purely hypothetical in nature. And so we have to be careful when we go about thinking about, you know, how long something is going to take because it's so dependent on so many factors that are beyond our control. And I think we have to, yes, we are very impatient nowadays. We want results right away. But unfortunately, that's not the way that situations like this work. It's not the way that they play out in most cases. So with all of that in mind, there's been a lot of discussion already about what a replacement bridge might look like. You know, it is often said in the movie business that the sequel is never as good as the original. Well, the MDTA is going to try to buck that trend with a successor bridge that is even better than its original. Um, you have, you may have heard some ideas get thrown around and I'm going to throw a couple of things out there at you. Um, let's start with the existing bridge approaches. Um, while they did survive the collapse in most part, it's very unlikely that they will be recycled, um, for any successor project. It's worth remembering that the key bridge opened in 1977. So by the time that a second bridge was well underway, these pieces of the structure would be 50 years old. So it's not like they were built recently or could be easily retrofitted into some sort of, to conform with modern standards. Um, it is much better in a situation like this to simply start over than to try to incorporate whatever survived from the original into the construction of something new. Um, let's not take shortcuts here. Let's do this right. Something else that I think will be talked about is that <clears throat> you're going to have different options, that, which I believe this is a federal thing. Federal law stipulates that you have to have certain alternatives when you're studying the construction of a project. Um, there's going to be a no-build alternative. I know that people don't like hearing that. Don't shoot the messenger on this, but I'm just telling you that 
by federal law, they are required to have a no build where the bridge simply does not get replaced. That is part of the study. However, I wonder if because this is a state of emergency situation that some of these requirements might be waived. I don't know the answer to that, but that's going to be something worth looking into. Um, you will have, as I said, the no build alternative. There will be bridge alternatives on new alignments. There will probably be tunnel alignments on new tunnel ideas on new alignments. Now, the same issue that doomed the tunnel in the 1970s, I believe, is going to doom the tunnel in the 2020s. And that is because tunnels simply cost that much more up front. And because of the intricate ventilation systems that are involved, they require a lot more maintenance annually. And of course, this adds up cost-wise. And I would imagine that the MDTA is not going to be interested in inheriting a third tunnel facility that they have to spend expensive dollars on annually maintaining. The other not thing to mention, too, that this, you know, this bridge um, was also, you know, the, the route for vehicles that had a hazard um, for hazmats. For I was hazmats. just about to say that. Yep, that's right. So yeah. the so the detour for hazmats and overheights that was so valuable in the metro would be permanently lost by the construction of a tunnel. And I can't imagine people at the local and state level being okay with that. Um, let's talk about contracting for a second. Um, this is a replace as soon as possible situation. So I am I am not a betting man. But if I were to go to Vegas with my most recent paycheck and put it down on something, I would tell you that this is going to be a design-build project. What that means is that a client agency, in this particular case the MDTA, will award a single contract to a most likely joint venture group of contractors who operate under a single umbrella. Um, and they hire their own consulting companies to do inspection. And one of the things that makes Design Build unique is that the contracting joint venture inherits all of the risk for not only the construction of the bridge, but also its design. So it all happens under one roof. It's not, you know, you're not dealing with a design firm in Idaho, you know, with a, con with a contractor in Maryland. Everybody is under the same roof in the same building, and they're working together to design the bridge at the same time that it's being built. Now, naturally, what happens in situations like this is that this is, the design is always well ahead of the construction, but certain fine details of the design won't be finalized when construction actually begins. And this is not unusual. We have seen this in other locations around uh, the country, most specifically in New York State with the replacement of the Tappan Zee Bridge. That was a design-build project. <clears throat> and actually what's interesting is that when you look at the renderings for that bridge when the project began in 2013, there are differences between the renderings and how it ended up in actuality in 2019. And that's because of the relative fluidity of the design-build method. You end up with the same bridge, more or less, but there are differences and nuances that are a little bit uh, different than what you go into the project assuming they would be. So I'm going to say this is going to be a design build. Um, there's going to be an emphasis on prefabrication and offsite assembly. Baltimore Harbor is beautifully positioned right at the north end of Chesapeake Bay, and it will have great access to the ocean and any uh, waterfront assembly facility on the east coast of the United States. So anything that is built of steel or precast concrete can be assembled anywhere on up and down the east coast and simply brought to the site by barge so you can have several different off-site facilities working simultaneously building chunks of this bridge that can be set into place once they arrive on site so for instance and this is just one example but you could have you know thousand ton sections of structural steel that are brought to the site or you could have in this particular slide we have 
seven or 800 ton sections of precast concrete that are barged to the site and then they are set into place. Rather than it taking weeks to build something like this on site, you can simply spend that time in an off site yard building it off site while other stuff is going on concurrently at the bridge site itself. So all these operations can sort of overlap one another time wise, and that's how you can compress a schedule down from a seven-year construction window to a four-and-a-half-year construction window because you're accomplishing so many different things simultaneously rather than waiting for one step to end and then you begin the next step. You can do four or five steps at the same time. Now, it's nice to have these thousand-ton pieces of equipment, pieces of you know material to place on a bridge at once, but you need heavy-duty equipment to be able to set those pieces into place. And there just so happens to be, you know, certain cranes available on the East Coast to serve just that purpose. Um, as an engineer, I have become very familiar with some of these pieces of equipment. Uh, this one pictured here is the Left Coast Lifter, the crane barge that was built in 2012. It first came to use out in San Francisco with the completion of the East Bay portion of the San Francisco Bay Bridge project. It spent about five years on the Hudson River at Terrytown, New York on the replacement of the Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, it has, the barge itself is enormous. It's over 300 feet long. The, the, the boom, the crane boom itself is about 330 feet tall. Yeah, the barge is more like 500 feet. The crane boom is about 300 feet. Um, <clears throat> the maximum lift capacity of the, the left coast lifter is about 1,700 tons. It was used, there were over 80 picks of this crane that exceeded 1,000 tons over the course of the construction of the Tappan Zee project from 2014 through 2018. This is just one of those picks that I happened to catch in progress. And you can see what you can accomplish when you have a crane that size, where you can just lift huge chunks of superstructure at once. By comparison, if you were to do this you know, piece by piece, it would take you at least a week to assemble this much steel. And here this crane can do it in a day. So because of the compressed nature of the timeline it's going to be important to get the new key bridge or the key bridge 2 open as soon as possible you're going to see i believe a lot of different mechanisms to compress the schedule so design build method you're also going to see ways in the means and methods department to compress the amount of time that it takes to actually build the thing on site and that involves as i said off-site assembly, prefabrication, and these large-scale cranes that you see, like the one that's currently sitting in Staten Island as we speak. That's where the lifter has been positioned since 2019, but we'll see if that continues to be the case for much longer. There's one other example that I want to bring up on the subject of precast and prefabrication before we go. And there are a lot of examples of this that I could go on and on about for the rest of the evening. But I also want to bring up to you a bridge that's very fond to me. And it's actually right over the border from Maryland. Um, and this is the Senator Roth Bridge on Delaware Route 1, which was open to traffic in 1995. It is a clinic in precast assembly and construction. The bridge is built of precast blocks, basically, that make up the piers and the main towers. Virtually all of the major structural elements in this bridge are made of precast concrete. As I said, the blocks for the piers, the main towers are built the same way out of these precast sections. Um, everything in the roadway from the precast uh, concrete segments that are glued together from the gantries that assembled them, uh, the delta frames that connect these deck segments to the cables that are anchored into the towers. It was basically a pre-assembly 101 uh, episode for you if you were interested in that kind of thing. And the bridge, as I said, opened in 1995. And almost 30 years later, um, the bridge has performed beautifully over its lifespan. 
And so these are these kinds of things I would expect, or what you can expect to see a lot of uh, in the years ahead. You know, we can build any bridge that we want, really, but with means and methods, I would expect you'll see something along the lines of the examples that I've just given you uh, from Delaware and from the Hudson Valley of New York State. Um, so that is the long-term future, but it's going to take a long time for us to get to a resolution to this issue. And um, again, I would like to say that what happened on March 26, God willing, is a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. We have not seen a disaster of this type, really, since the Sunshine Skyway Bridge collapse in 1980, which was another collision with a freighter in Tampa Bay. Um, it had been 44 years since we had seen something like this, and... Um, I hope it's at least another 44 years before something else happens, and we will learn a lot of lessons from this. Um, a lot of things will change, both locally in Baltimore and globally, in terms of safety systems, um, whether that's bridge-related or ship-related. I think that that's, the latter is the most interesting of the two. Um, and I think we will emerge better off from this in the long run. But... Um, Laura, that's all I got. Um, I'm sure yeah, you might you have for... some closing thoughts, but uh, I want to. I know Laura, you're. This is a week night for you, so I know you're busy. But I really appreciate you taking the time tonight. Yeah, I am so glad you invited me. Um, yeah, I've got some closing thoughts. Thank you for going into all the details from you know the bridge engineering side. Um, I obviously come at this from the urban planning side. Um, I think that, you know, and a lot of people are bringing this up in the chat and, and, you know, I suspect I am also not, you know, a betting person, but I, I suspect that it would be that the key bridge two would be a cable state bridge. Um, I think that would be very fitting symbolically. Um, you know, I talk about the symbol, you know, the symbolism of, um, I talked about the symbolism of, uh, you know, the, the steel continuous trust bridge, um, with steel industry, you know, the first thing I always think of when I look at a cable stay bridge is, hey, that looks like sailboats. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what, Baltimore and Maryland it, overall, you know, being having the Chesapeake Bay be like, you know, a, a huge part of the state is shipping and boats and sailboats. So I, you know, looking at this from, you know, just an amateur, <laughs> you know, very amateur design perspective. I can see, you know, there being symbolism in that if that's what, you know, the key bridge two is designed as. Um, I think that ultimately, the, I think that the youth of this generation are going to relate to the key bridge two in, oh, sure. yeah. in the way that the older generations today relate. Um, as a lot of you know, I have a young child and who I did show the bridge videos to. Um, and she was very concerned, by the way. <laughs> She's almost five. Yeah. Could, um, you, could you touch on like what what it's like to try to explain what happened to a, a four, almost five year old? Absolutely. So, you know, and I'll. I'll do this as, you know, basically it's very interesting because she's at an age of where she's really understanding things. Um, she, I asked her if she remembered going over the bridge and she said she did. I showed her the, you know, I showed her the a past video that you took of going over the bridge. Very likely the one that we're watching as we speak. And she very much said she remembered it. I showed her then, you know, the video of the collapse. I started it a few minutes before, so you can really see the boat approach. And she was very aware that the boat was going to hit the bridge. And she was very concerned about traffic on the bridge. And I kept reassuring her, like, don't worry. They're going to they're gonna get off. They're, they're going to stop the traffic in time. They're going to stop the traffic in time. And we watched that happen. And just the miracle of the fact that the police were able to stop the traffic 
right before it collapsed. Um, what's very interesting is that you know, no, I don't give, I don't give my child, um, un, I don't, I don't give her unlimited access to YouTube. I don't even give her access to YouTube Kids um, without supervision. So I'm very mindful about you know the algorithms and things. Oh yeah, you got to be really careful about that nowadays. Yeah. Oh yeah, you do. But but I bring that up to say that after showing her these videos. The, um, the next, you know, the next video that the algorithm, um, you know, recommended and then auto, you know, auto played before I could stop it in time was a video of Galloping Gertie. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. And, another classic from engineering school. Yeah. The Tacoma, Nar the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940. And that, and she was mesmerized by the, that video. We watched it over and over and over and over. Well, and we've got you've she, got a future engineer on your hands, I think. It's possible, it's very possible. <laughs> but she was definitely, she was like, you know, she saw the people walking from the, away from the bridge. She saw the man on the bridge running and having to leave his car there. I did not tell her about the dog. <laughs> yeah, she's a little too young to know about the dog, but that's okay. Yes, there was a dog that unfortunately got left behind in the car and died. Yeah. But you know, but still, she just mesmerized seeing you know the bridge collapse and the car and it was very you know like i this could be very well be something she remembers i mean i i don't know that if anything she might be confused in the future and think that the key bridge collapse was galloping gertie <laughs> but um that might be what she remembers more than the other videos but um it's very, but it's She's at like she's at an age where she can really start to understand things, and so, you know, she got it. And we went and looked um, at, you know, I took her on Friday. Well, my, uh, you know, Mike and I, um, we we met up there at Sparrows Point, and she very much understood. Like this is the bridge from the videos. This is, you know, and that this was really important. And, you know, she and she asked if we could take a selfie by it. And so we did. So we do have this very, like, smiley selfie, which is, uh, you know, because that is one thing that, you know, kids don't have the same, you know, reactions that adults do to things. So, uh, you know, but she was very much, you know, in tune with what was going on. And I suspect, you know, so she's, you know, set to enter kindergarten in the fall and her elementary years are going to be of watching this bridge, uh, you know, watching the, you know, the, the new key bridge too. Yeah. They're, they're very formative years for a kid and she's going to be well positioned to see the new bridge take shape. And that's, that's going to be very impressionable in its own right. It is. So, it really is. and I know that because you're Mrs. MD Rhodes, I know that you'll uh, be taking her down to see it. <laughs> oh, most definitely. And all the vantage points. And... Yep. Yes, most definitely. Um, I mean, so she's amazingly burned over the bridge quite a few times. Um, one of our dearest friends um, lives in Dundalk that we've given rides to and from to see other um, family and friends in D.C., because um, our said friend um, doesn't drive. And so, you know, that it, it stuck out to me, too. You know, the idea that there have been times I've driven, not with, not with, not with her, but with my friend, very late at night on that bridge, because I've also picked them up from the airport. Right, because as you said, it is kind of the best way to get to the airport from where you are. Yeah. It's a good way to bypass, you know, the more like downtown area. So it's, it's the scenic route. It is the scenic route. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting to see what it's going to be named. I noticed this is a, a question in the chat. Is it also going to be named Francis Scott Keybridge? They renamed the Tappet Zoo when they replaced it. Hope they don't do that here. Well, as Dan and I and everyone else can attest, what a bridge formally gets named is not necessarily what it gets called in practice. <laughs> Well, that's so, true, ain't it? It is. So, I, the reality is, I, I know that there's, it's, it can, this can get very, 
I, I, I want to tread on this very carefully. And I recommend to everyone to go to Fort McHenry um, National Monument um, and to read up more about Francis Scott Key and his life. And yes, unfortunately, he owns slaves. And will that be a factor in the renaming? Or is he, as the, you know, writer of what ultimately became our national anthem, is he on the level of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson? Those are questions that are going to be addressed in the coming years. Yeah, he almost he almost has a godlike status in Maryland. He does, yes. He, he kind of, I would, I would say so. Very much, you know, we take a lot of pride. And it's hard to believe that 2014 was 10 years ago. But let me just say the bicentennial for the for the for 1814 and the Battle of Baltimore, it was huge. Oh, it was sure, yeah. a huge deal. I can still say to this day that was the most incredible fireworks display. So I Mike and I went to Fort McHenry and you know for the celebrations and we saw the fireworks. It was the, it's to this day still the most impressive display I've ever seen. Hmm. And so I think that, you know, will it, you know, I think that ultimately it's always going to be known as the Key Bridge in the, you know, in a way that a lot of people still call the Tappan, you know, the Governor Mario Cuomo Bridge, the Tappan, the, the new Tappan Z Bridge. Yeah. So I, I, I think that ultimately that is what's going to happen regardless. And I, but yes, I do think that there's going to be some tough questions. Um, but those are just tough questions that we're reckoning with, with all of our historical figures. Yeah. There, there has been a movement in that direction really since 2020. Right. And so we've really been examining all of our historical figures, not just ones here and there. Um, so yeah, that, that's, this is going to be something that I think plays out in the background in the next few years for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think. As far as the new bridge is concerned, as we're watching the, uh, this is, we watched the northbound bridge crossing, now we're watching the southbound bridge crossing. These are videos that I actually posted on my channel in the last couple of days. I had, I had filmed them and then I just completely forgot that I had them. Um, and these are from, I think, 2023. Um, the last time I filmed this bridge, in fact. Um, so I thought I'd throw these up online, and so these are now sort of like the pre-collapse videos, if you will, I guess. Um, but yeah, so I would imagine that any new bridge that is built at this site, um, and again, we're, we're, we're happy to take your questions in the live chat if you have any for us, because um, we are going to wrap up in a few minutes here. But um, any new bridge that takes you know, takes the place of what was here before. Um, <clears throat> it will probably have the working title of either Francis Scott Key or Outer Harbor Crossing. Um, I still think that Key Bridge 2 is pretty trendy, and I think we should copyright that. But um, you're, you're probably... There will be a lot of different designs looked at, and I think one of, one of the things that you're going to definitely see is a bridge that is built to modern interstate standards. So that means the existing bridge, as you see here, it has the lanes that you need. It just doesn't have the shoulders. So you're going to have full width shoulders on the right for sure and standard shoulders on the left. And I, I'm not even sure that the grades on this bridge are interstate standards. So you're going to have much gentler rise and fall in the deck. Um, the other thing that's really trendy on new bridges these days are shared use paths, and these are dedicated facilities that accommodate pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Um, I can certainly see a scenario where Fort Armistead Park is linked to Dundalk by way of a greenway of sorts, you know, featuring a shared use path on this new bridge, which the existing bridge had no way of accommodating. Um, these are so those are the kinds of things that I would keep an eye out for, you know, that get incorporated into the new bridge. As far as what the new bridge will look like, again, there will be many different options that will be examined. Um, I'm sure there will be a contingent of people who want to see basically a replacement of what was already there. So a replication of the cantilever truss idea. 
from an economic standpoint and a financial standpoint, it's going to be much more realistic for them to put back a cable state bridge. And cable state bridges have been all the rage in the United States the last 25, 30 years. It's no secret. Um, you know, I have experience with one here in the Hudson Valley of New York, for instance, with the, the Tap and Z replacement. But um, <clears throat> the um, Laura, if you can keep an eye on the chat just to see if any questions come in. Um, the, uh, the, the, the idea of cable stay is intentional because you are able to build bridges with long or intermediate length spans that require far less steel than your typical steel suspension bridge or your cantilever truss bridge. That is why the cable stay bridge became popular. It was an economic reason, not necessarily an aesthetic reason. But the idea of the cable stay bridge caught on all across the country, all across North America. It was really a late bloomer to North America. It really didn't catch on until the 1980s. The real first breakthrough with cable stay bridges was the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in 1987, which, as we alluded to before, was the product of another ship collision with a bridge uh, in Tampa Bay. So... 40 to 50 years later, you know, cable stay bridges are now more popular than ever in the United States. It will not surprise me to see something along those lines uh, come to Baltimore uh, with uh, the Key Bridge sequel, as I'll call it. Um, again, I, I am not a betting man. I'm not telling you this is definitely going to happen. But based on the bits of evidence that you see and based on the trends in the industry and in construction and and all that the 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 dots on the map sort of line up in that direction so that's that's kind of where i'm i'm willing to bet my money at this point and i'm not going to give you a construction timeline these things these things are very complicated. These large scale projects that will cost billions of dollars. It will cost multiple billions of dollars to replace this bridge when it's all said and done. Um, these things take years. If we're going to do it right, let's take our time with it. Um, and let's get this right. And let's build something that Baltimore can be proud of for the next hundred years. That's really what my focus is on at this point. And, um, I know that everybody involved in it will share my point of view on that, and we will get it done. But it's going to take some time to get there. But uh, with patience and with perseverance, um, we will build something that Marylanders in general can be proud of. And I look forward to opening day of the new bridge, whenever that might be. But for now, um, this has been our retrospective look at the original key bridge from 1977 to 2024. And um, I think we're going to leave it at that. Yeah. Um, I want to throw out there and um, I'm trying to get the third link, because, but it's being my, my computer's being very slow. Ah, found it. Um, but basically um, uh, there's, there's a couple of local companies that are um, doing fundraiser key bridge shirts. And so I'm actually putting the links to those in the chat if people are interested that will directly go to support port workers and uh, port unions. Um, Route One Apparel is a very popular local company that does a lot of like, you know, Maryland flag, you know, very themed sort of stuff. Um, and um oh yeah i'm glad you posted the link to the support the port initiative yeah and so i'm i'm trying to get the other because i i have two links up um for route one apparel's site and then for another company um i've got their link up as well um and that one i think is about to close the one that's um the support the port t-shirt and i cannot think offhand what the name of the other company is um, but yeah, I think the, the one that you made me aware of ends tomorrow, I think. I think so. Yes. Yeah. It's the one that is, um, that was initially sold at, oh, it's uh, old Eastern ink shop is who's printing them. And 
is um, they sold a limited um, selection of them already at Key Brewing Company, which is in Dundalk. Um, but yeah, so Old Eastern Ink Shop. And Old Eastern is actually um, a road in Essex. Um, but yeah, so their their order ends tomorrow. So I just put their link in the chat. Oh, the last link gave a 404. No! <laughs> <laughs> well if you go to i think you can go to facebook and find old eastern shop on facebook right you can yeah so you can um you can find um yeah the old eastern ink shop is what it's called and i unfortunately couldn't get the link to work and then i have the link directly from my from facebook is um, unfortunately too long for me to put in the YouTube chat. What we can also do is Dan can also post um, links on the um, on the RoboWiz Facebook page. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. If you send them to me right after the show, that's fine. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll do that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So stay so... tuned to my Facebook page if you want to learn more about that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, Laura, I think we should start wrapping up. Um, I think so too. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you're, uh, you're quite busy on your end, so I know you got to go soon. But do you have any quick uh, final comments for us? Um, I, I'm just double checking really fast. I don't think there was anything else in the in the chat. Speak now or forever hold your peace. In the next like thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> right, if if you have a question that comes up, you know, later, like after you watch the show and you, you think of something that you want to ask us after we've gone off the air, you know, you can always leave a comment in the uh, the comment section below and I will uh, address it uh, as best I can. You know, that, that's what we're here for. Absolutely. And but yeah, I just thank you for inviting me to do this, Dan, because um, this bridge is near and dear to my heart and it was and so I'm glad that we've had this uh, ability to, you know, really, you know, talk about it together. Absolutely. And uh, I thought of you immediately when I got the idea to do this presentation. And so I'm glad we were able to work this out around our busy schedules and whatnot. It's it's very weird that we're doing this on a weeknight, but that is the way that it worked out. But Yeah. Um, a, a big part of that, too, is because my family is actually planning to leave in the morning to head to Ohio. To um, see the, to, you know, take our chance at seeing the um, <laughs> eclipse in totality on Monday. Oh, yeah. By the way, the eclipse on Monday. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. So, hence why it's a, you know, Friday Friday night special as opposed to our normal Saturdays. That's right. Yep. But, uh, Laura, I want to thank you very much for joining us. She is uh, affiliated with mdroads.com and... Uh, I want to get your title right before we sign off. Adjunct professor in the landscape architecture department at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Laura, uh, thank you very much. She's been a she's a veteran uh, contributor to this program, and uh, this was obviously a very special program that we threw together uh, on short notice for you folks. But we certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, you've been watching another Roadway Wiz live webinar presentation. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button if you would, if you enjoyed what you watched this evening. There's plenty more live content in the pipeline in the future. Uh, and until then, I'd like to thank all of you who took the time to watch this episode. So, Laura, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you who, who watched. And um, until also, next... want to do a quick quick shout out. Um... <laughs> I also work as a uh, planner for a local municipality. Might have some of uh, my coworkers listening too, so wanted to make sure that was thrown out there. <laughs> well, I, I hope they enjoyed it too. So, yes. Um...